Okay, and we are back with another episode of Leadership Lessons. I am your host, Lewis Howe, and I'm here with the man himself, Mr. Kesha. Back, how you doing, my friend? Good, how are you? I'm, Good. I'm wearing denim on denim, so I yeah, can't no. complain. Do you know what I mean? They said it's a fashion crime. At no point in my life have I believed this to be a crime. Do you know what I mean? So I'm good, but yeah, I'm here with an amazing guest. Yeah. And I, you need to do a full introduction for Susan because mm-hmm. we just had a little a chat about the kind of work Susan does. And this is not something that we can take lightly. Do you know not what I mean? Not at all, not at all. So that is why we need to really, really do a full introduction. <laughs> And, and let the viewers know exactly what we're going to be talking about today. But this is vital information. And, and today's episode is all about pressing pause. We've actually got an amazing giveaway for you today. That is it. Which I had a whole intro prepared, but when you described it, it was so much better. So yeah, yeah, tell yeah. us about the giveaway oh, okay, today. Okay. So it's my ebook. Um, it's called Pressing Pause. Um, pressing Pause, a practical guide to mindfulness in everyday life. Um, so it's literally 10 steps to bringing mindfulness into what you do every day. Um, so it's a kind of quick, easy, you can read it on your phone, you know, really quick and easy introduction to mindfulness. Definitely. So Ooh. guys, literally, as you go about watching this episode, drop your comments below, yeah, about, you know, for example, some great practices of mindfulness that you've maybe taken on. And then those who share the be- greatest comments are going to get copies of the ebook. So that is our giveaway for today. <laughs> Make sure you're active in the comments below. But let's go straight into it, Kesh. I don't think we should waste any time. And my thing is, first and foremost, mindfulness is a bit of a buzzword right mm-hmm. now. I feel as if it's something that in the last few years, people are just saying, oh, you must practice mindfulness, you yeah. must practice mindfulness. But what is mindfulness? Mm, it's a good question. And why should people listen to you about it? Yeah, okay. So, well, I mean, I've been practicing mindfulness for seven years, uh, maybe, maybe a little bit longer than that. Um, and when I say practicing mindfulness, yes, there's the meditation side of it, but there's also just being more mindfully aware in everyday life. So I've been kind of doing all of that stuff for about seven years. And I work with individuals, business owners, leaders, managers in organisations, and also just people who kind of want to get a bit more balance in their lives. So um, so I kind of, I know, the, I know the theory of it. I've just finished a master's in mindfulness. So I kind of know the theory, I've done some research, but I, I know what it's like in practice because I do it as well. Um, so what is it? Sometimes it's easier to actually look at what it isn't. Okay. Because we're very good at being mindless. Most of us are better at being mindless than we are at being mindful. So what does mindless look like? Well, we're in London um, and you just have to go out, this, out onto the street and you can see a lot of mindlessness. People doing one thing while doing something else. So walking along the street looking at their phone. So they're not really focused on walking along the street or on their phone because they're doing two things at once. So when, when we do two things at once, that's when we're not really being mindful on anything. Mm. Um, when we do things without thinking, so all the habits that we have, now habits are great because if we didn't have habits on how we do stuff, we'd have to think about literally everything we did every day, which would be yeah. exhausting. But the thing is we develop habits for things like what we eat and how we eat and whether we do or don't exercise and how we think about people and how we react to things. And mindfulness is about being more consciously aware of that stuff. Mm -hmm. So most of the time, we're just doing what we do, doing one thing, but thinking about the next thing. um, And we're not really aware of what's going on around us. So mindfulness, I guess if we want a definition, it's about knowing what's happening as it happens. So just being aware of what's going on. So we're sitting here right now. So our minds could be in lots of different places, or it could be just getting a real sense of what it feels like to sit on the sofa noises we can hear, things we can see. So just being really present. So that's that's basically what it is. Yeah, because I've, I've also heard that people say, you know, the key thing about mindfulness, as you said, is about being present and raising yeah. our level of awareness, but more importantly, also being non-judgmental. Absolutely. So I don't know if you want to expand yeah. a little bit on that also. So the second part, the first part of the definition is knowing what's happening as it happens. And the second part is without preference. Okay. Because what we start to notice when you, when you start to become more mindful, you start to become more aware that you like some things and don't like other things. Mm. And you choose this thing over that thing. Mm. And um, sometimes we, we, when we become more aware of what's going on, we go, oh, I don't really want that. So I'll move away from that and I'll go to that. But actually what we're really doing is we're, we're really limiting our experience by doing that yeah, because yeah. we're choosing some things and not other things. Um, and also if there's something that we notice we don't like, mm. we work really hard to push it away. I'm not going to think about that. I don't, don't like that thought. I'll really not think about it. Or, or I don't like feeling like that. But actually, all of our thoughts, all of our feelings, everything we experience through our senses is just all part of being human. Yeah. And we can make life so much easier for ourselves when we are able to just be with whatever it is. Yeah. 
And actually, what you start to notice is that nothing lasts forever. Definitely. So the so the, the the negative thought or the bad feeling or the situation that we're not comfortable with doesn't last forever. So it moves on. But when we keep trying to like wrestle with it and make it different, we actually encourage it to hang around for longer. Definitely. I know, Kesh, you've got some really powerful questions to ask. But just one more from me quickly, because we have young people that watch us. You might be in mm. school. We have people who are, you know, students in university. We also have people who want to become social leaders through their careers or through activism they do outside of work. Yeah. And you spoke a little bit before we turned on the camera about the fact that in business, in life, you have these peaks and troughs. Yeah. But what you found is that through your commitment and your practice of mindfulness, you've almost allowed yourselves yourself to maintain was like an emotional or mental neutrality mm. where that doesn't necessarily affect you as much. So mm. can you just share with people like why that is so important and then maybe one or two things you've done in order to be able to do that? Mm. I think it's really important because um you know life is a bit of a roller coaster. I'm sure there's a song in there somewhere. <laughs> um but yeah it, it is there are ups and downs. You yeah. know no matter how great your life is, we all experience downs at some point and mm. some people have a lot of those not such great um, times in their lives and so I think it's it's so important and particularly young people I mean God you know I'm not going to say how old I am but I wouldn't want to be you know <laughs> I, I, I think there's a lot of real um, pressure on young people um, and so there's a lot of social media and a lot of input from other people so there's a lot of comparisons and I need to be this and I need to do that and I need to have this and be that and actually, so I think it's really important um, for everyone, but for young people in particular. And the great thing is that when you're younger, you haven't had the same length of time to develop the really ingrained habits that make it more difficult to change when you're older. Okay. So I think there's a lot of mindfulness happening in schools now with like really young kids. Mm -hmm. My nieces and nephews who are like really tiny are learning about mindfulness, which right. is just amazing. I'm thinking if I knew about mindfulness when I was studying and doing exams and stuff and even just dealing with you know going through puberty and all that stuff that's really quite hard work and then setting up your own business wow it yeah. would have been so much easier so I think it's great there is loads of mindfulness happening in schools um but I think you know we don't have to wait for someone to come and teach us mindfulness I mean, it's it's an innate capacity we all have mm, we're born with it mm. if you look at kids they're totally mindful. Of course. They're just totally course. in the moment of whatever they're doing. And then something goes wrong and they'll scream about it for a bit and then they move on and yeah. they're happy. Yeah. So we, we can all do it. But, but as we get older and as we experience life, layers and layers of stuff get put on top of that Definitely. and we find it more difficult. So I guess my mindfulness practice, you know, actually sitting and meditating, and I think we're maybe going to have a go at doing a wee bit of, yeah, of that later. Um, but it doesn't have to be sitting cross-legged, you know, with incense burning whatever <laughs> you can do that if you want but it doesn't have to be it can literally that's why i talk about pressing pause for me that's been the biggest thing is just noticing when i've got caught up in that treadmill or caught up in that cycle of thinking and it's just like pausing live tv it's just going hold on a minute and the the simplest but most powerful thing you can do is just breathe I mean, you're breathing anyway, mm. but just notice that you're breathing. Just allow a few breaths to come. And that doesn't just make you feel better kind of mentally, but physically. Yeah. It has an effect. It activates a, a system in the, you know, a, a nervous system in the body called the vagus nervous system. Mm. And it just helps to reduce your heart rate and your blood pressure and all those things that make you feel a bit like that. <sighs> yeah. just helps to calm you. Literally, when I meditate, I literally will sit. Often I meditate after having done exercise and things like that. It might not be straight after, but I'm talking about, you know, like within say an hour or so after having exercised. And I literally feel that, like I will sit down because I might have been walking then I've got to the place where I'm going to meditate. I sit down and as soon as I close my eyes and begin to breathe, I literally feel my heart go from beating at whatever pace yeah. to just so slow. Yeah. And I just think it's just phenomenal how that mm. feeling, do you know what I mean? But yeah. yeah. But Kesh, what was one of the, the big questions that you really mm. wanted to ask? It, well, there's a few now that, <laughs> now that you've spoken. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I've, yeah. I've been very quietly just... Yeah. Take it, being mindful. Mm, Something yeah. that I learned um, yesterday, I, I went for my first, very first ever sports massage and wow. a very small, amazing, funny Indian lady just absolutely brutally battered me, but yeah. in, in, a, <laughs> in, a in the name, way. in a good way. <laughs> um, and she's talking about breathing actually. And, and she said, uh, show me your meditation practice. And I, I've been doing something called uh, Wim Hof breathing. Mm -hmm. um, so I showed her and she was saying, you're, you're breathing mainly into your lungs, but actually yeah. she was saying that there's actually a, the amount of air that your diaphragm, your lungs, your throat, but your belly can take in is different amounts. Mm -hmm. I was just wondering if that was something that you found through your study as well. And is it, 
is there a difference between um and I'm I'm selfishly asking here or selffully <laughs> uh, you know is there a benefit to breathing into your stomach mm. over your lungs like do those things matter is it just mm. about pausing and taking that moment yeah I mean I I don't know a huge amount about the kind of the physiology of breathing and um, but what I know is breathing is really important is really helpful and we do it so unconsciously and mindlessly that when we start to focus attention on it it's like anything there's a, there's a great saying that energy follows focus so wherever you put your focus that's where your energy is going to go and when we put our energy into something we generally get more benefit from it so I think if we focus on breathing now I guess we need to be aware of the fact some people have challenges with breathing physical challenges some people have anxiety and breathing is an issue so we need to just be a little bit sensitive to that but I think it's all about tuning into ourselves and we, we can start to kind of play with it and I think that's that's the thing about mindfulness have fun with it don't take it too seriously mm, yeah. um so play around with it because we you know everyone knows their body better than you know we know our own body better than anyone else does so people watching this will will be able to tune into how their own breath feels so just first of all start noticing before you do anything to change your breathing. Just notice how breath feels. Where do you notice it? And the first place most people tune into their breath is around their nostrils because you kind of feel it coming in and out. So you can notice that and then you can notice it in your chest. And for a lot of people, that's where they really feel their breath and maybe just a little bit lower kind of where mm -hmm. their lungs are. But our breath travels through our entire body. So when we start to really notice it and we start to breathe just a little bit more deeply, and, and focus on actually expand, expanding the belly, you do notice a change. Mm. Now, I'm not going to sit here and kind of um, pretend to know all the physiological details about that, but yes, there is a benefit to breathing more deeply um, because it, it, it has an effect on, um, you know, how our blood circulates, oxygen going to the brain, mm. um, and it has a naturally calming effect for most people most times, but obviously people just need to be tuned into what's mm. going on for them in that moment. But yeah, just, just breathing. And w the way that I practice mindfulness is we start off just focusing on the breath, but then we consciously deepen the breath slightly. So that's where I notice my breathing going from being here, which is where it is probably normally, down to about here. Mm. And I do notice that difference. So yeah, so you can, can play around with it. And, and I think there are different benefits mm. to breathing differently. And I think on that, let, let's, I would love to do a quick little... You can choose either sure. of us to be a live dummy yeah. and it'd be good to well, do why, a little why don't Why don't we all do it? Okay, cool. Okay, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah, yeah. So what we're going to do, guys, is you're going to show us and mm -hmm. guide us through a bit of uh, mindfulness and meditation. Yeah. Um, and for those of you who are watching, you can join in too if you're watching mm -hmm. this later as a snippet. You know, put this on your phone, download it, and, and you've got an easy, quick guide yep. to kind of help you to get mm. mindful. So. Okay. So what first thing I would I would say is, um, while there's no right and wrong way to sit, it's really helpful just to be aware of your posture. Now, what some people find is when they start focusing on their breathing and start feeling relaxed, if their body, if their posture is too relaxed, they start to just nod off. <laughs> so that's what I've just finished running an eight-week course, and on that, the biggest challenge people had was not falling asleep while yeah, they were practicing. Yeah, yeah. So it can be helpful. What I would tend to say is sit a little bit forward in your chair. Um, so, you know, and this is a thing you can do with sitting on the tube, on the bus, you know, um, at your desk, whatever. Um, but yeah, if you just sit forward, what that does is it means that you have to just work a little bit more to hold your posture. So there's really nothing special, but um, your, your posture is almost like a container for your practice. So you want it to support you. So think about sitting nice and upright and alert. Um, so almost like you've got a, a string coming right through the body, up through the top of the head, but have the chin tucked in slightly just so your the back of your neck is, is, is nice and straight. So you don't want to be like rigid like a soldier, but, but yeah, feel kind of upright and alert. Feet flat on the floor just to get that sense of grounding. Um, and then you can put your hands wherever you want. Some people like to clasp them in their lap, some people just resting on their, on their hands, whatever feels comfortable. And eyes open or closed that's a, a debate it's entirely up to you um closing our eyes can help us to kind of focus more inward so you're welcome to just gently close your eyes if you prefer to keep your eyes open or you're somewhere where it feels like that's a better thing to do dropping your gaze slightly maybe you know three or four feet in front of um of where you're sitting just drop your gaze and allow your eyes to just unfocus so you're not staring at anything 
just allowing the eyes to rest. So that's us got our posture and really all we're going to do, maybe just for a minute or so, is just become aware of what it feels like to breathe. So just notice where you feel your breath most strongly right now. So you might notice it around the nostrils as the cold air moves in and then the slightly warmer air leaves the nostrils. Maybe you notice your chest moving up and down. Or maybe even the belly expanding and contracting. So not thinking about the breath, but just feeling how the breath feels as it moves in and out of the body. So just getting a real sense of the movement and the flow of the breath. And noticing if the mind gets distracted, perhaps by noise or a thought. And just see if it's possible to just come back to an awareness of the breath. So just noticing how the body feels sitting here, maybe a sense of the contact between the body and what the body's sitting on. The feet on the floor. So an awareness of the breath sitting here, the body sitting here, breathing. Just knowing that you've got nowhere to go and nothing to do for these few seconds as you just take time to focus on your breath. And you might want to just rest attention a little bit more on the out breath. And notice how the body feels as you release each breath. Noticing any tendency for the body to relax a little as it releases the breath. And as the body relaxes and releases the breath, see if the mind can release any involvement with thinking and just come to settle. So just noticing how this feels and being aware that the practice of mindfulness is noticing each time the mind moves away from awareness of the breath. And when you notice that's happened, not, not beating yourself up or thinking you've done something wrong, simply noticing where the mind's gone and then bringing it back to the breath and the body just sitting here. Okay, so we'll bring the short practice to a close. So just checking in with yourself, noticing how the body and the mind feel now after a minute or so of just pressing pause. Okay. So if you had your eyes closed, you might want to just open them and reconnect with your surroundings. was that? That was beautiful. Yeah, <laughs> that was really beautiful. I mean obviously you can do it for a lot longer or shorter um, but the key thing is when your mind wanders away from focusing on the breath bring it back and that's yeah. that's mindfulness that's the practice of mindfulness you might have to do it once or a hundred times mm. you're not getting it wrong you're getting it absolutely right the thing is you notice that your mind has wandered mm. so yeah because yeah, it's true because I, I guess like from the small amount that I know about mindfulness, one of the things that I've learned is the fact that we we are often thinking yeah. as opposed to sensing. Yeah. And mindfulness is about beginning to sense mm -hmm. as opposed to think. So as you said before, it's about that thing that your thoughts are going to wonder and just being aware of that, yeah. sensing it, 
And then sensing the way, you know, maybe your body fell or the yeah. way in which your breath changed when it wandered and bringing it back. Yeah. That's what it's about, you know. Yeah. But you yeah. should have an app or something because like that, I could yeah. listen to you guide me through meditation <laughs> very well. I need like an app, Susan. You know what I mean? Like that was that was called my voice. <laughs> Definitely. So what's the, we've got a lot of teachers who, mm-hmm. who watch us. And I know I was talking to you before the episode mm-hmm. um, about two things that I want to reference here. One was formal and informal yeah. practices. Um, but secondly, about using this in uh you know in the classroom for example and uh we were talking over email about that uh instance where s- there was a school that was using mm. meditation mindfulness for students who were in detention and it actually helped to yeah. lower the um disruptive behavior in that school and, mm. and the number of students in detention so mm. are there any teachers that you've worked with or you know mm-hmm. examples of schools that have used this yeah. you know in an everyday setting or even businesses yeah. uh, families etc that mm. Uh, you would recommend people check out? Yeah, so I know that there's now, um, uh, yeah, I know that there's quite a lot of specifically, you know, mindfulness specifically for schools um, programs out there. I know there's one, I don't know if it's just specifically in Scotland, um, but it's called Dot B. Yeah. So there are, right, okay, so yeah, there are some specific mindfulness programs for, for children, um, for young people. Um, I'm a member of the Mindfulness Association um, and they are currently developing and running youth mindfulness programme, which is for very much your kind of, you know, the target audience, you know, people who are in their sort of late teens into early 20s. So there is a lot of stuff going on out there. Um, I recently did um, a workshop with some head teachers and deputy head teachers um, from various schools in, in any area near where I live. Um, and I, I ran it and it was a mindful leadership program. And really what we were doing was helping the teachers to just be able to, in the moment when they're, you know, when they're feeling overwhelmed because there's a lot going on or maybe there's difficulties in the classroom, um, to for them to feel more calm so that they would then enable the kids to be more calm because you, you, you know it's it's like parents and children it's, it's like any two people if one person's getting worked up then it tends to rub off on the other person so if one person can can you know get a bit of calmness and and, and um, perspective on the situation it helps everyone else so mm. I think for teachers they find it really helpful to be able to just take that that moment and we we did something called a sigh breath okay. you know if, if things are getting on top of you, you go oh but we actually use that as a way of them really focusing on, as you said, sensing their breath and just taking that moment. Because in a classroom, you can't necessarily go, right, give me 10 minutes to go meditate. Yeah, yeah. You know, and, and some teachers say, I don't even have time to go to the toilet, let alone anything else. So just that mindful pause mm. for teachers. And, and what teachers are then finding is that they can then share that with their students. And when when students are and kids are getting kind of worked up and ah. Uh, just to take that moment to just breathe and to be able to talk about what their frustrations are or their concerns because it's not what we're not absolutely not saying is you know don't don't think about things that are annoying you don't think about things that are frustrating or angering you um we totally need to think about them and we totally mm. need to talk about them but doing it from a place where we are much more aware of um, how our emotions are driving what we're thinking and what we're saying mm. because we're very emotional human beings are primarily emotional creatures so mindfulness helps us to become more aware of our emotions not shut out emotions yeah. not shut out thoughts but actually look at them through a different lens mm. look at them in a we talk about taking the observer's position. So it's almost like being an observer on a riverbank. Mm. So you're sitting there and the river has all your thoughts. So all, everything that pops into your head is in your river. And you can sit there and actually just observe it and notice when you sometimes get dragged in. And next thing you know, you're trying to get, you know, get deal with the flow of the river. Yeah. When you can step back onto the riverbank, it means that you can observe your thoughts and go, okay, what's this trying to tell me? Okay, how do I feel about it? Mm. And that's that's a much more effective and healthy way to be looking at what's going on in our minds. I think this is amazing because like I, I never really like to delve into this side too deep, but at the same time, I think for me, mindfulness is almost a spiritual thing, right? It almost mm. allows us to connect on a spiritual level. And I know there's been a lot of talk recently about Jim Carrey and some of the stuff he's been yeah. saying, but I think mindfulness basically is singing from the same hymn sheet as he mm. is in, in that as you said before, it's taking a step back and realizing that this happened 
And, you know, Kesh uses a great line, which is that life doesn't happen to you, it happens for you. Mm -hmm. And I think it's when you start to think about what Jim Carrey was saying about the fact that he's like, you don't exist. He's like, you are just currently an inhabitant and an observer of this body, Mm -hmm. right? But you are, you exist in a different plane. Mm -hmm. And so I always used to say to people like, he would say, well, how do you get to the point where you manage to maintain calm? And I said, that's because as I speak about myself in the third person a lot, like, because in my mind, it's not, oh, I need to do this. It's that Lewis Howell needs to do this. Mm-hmm. And as soon as I do that, I then go in some situations where I used to, for example, flip out, get frustrated, get annoyed. What I always reconnect with is the Lewis Howell that I want to be, the Lewis Howell that I want to control. How would he, what would he do in this situation? Mm-hmm. And that's how I step back. So I just start mm-hmm. by talking about myself in the third person and almost acting as if, you know, that game, The Sims. Yeah. I'm just controlling this guy called Lewis Howell. But because it's like, you know, I saw Prince <laughs> EA say this in a, in a, in a, in a, um, in a motivational piece. And he was like, you can't be the body and the person at the same time. So that's what mindfulness mm. is about, you know? So, mm. yeah, so just brought that to my mind. Yeah, I mean, I think, I, I, I totally agree that I think mindfulness has a spiritual element to it. Yeah. And, and a lot of people, me included, who pra- start practicing mindfulness with no intention to be spiritual yeah, or anything yeah, like that, yeah. kind of start going, oh, okay, maybe something in this. But I think I think that can sometimes put people deter off. People, I know we've yeah, kind of talked deter. about... Yeah, that's why I didn't like to go there. Yeah, but, yeah, what stops people getting involved in it. And I think that that's maybe something that, might, that people might come to and realise. But I think the starting point for mindfulness is if you have, you know, a, a busy life, if you have a busy yeah. mind, if you've got yeah. a lot of stuff going on, if you know that... Some days you feel really up for things and other days you don't. If things frustrate you, if life is pretty good, but you just think it could be even better, I think that's the starting point. Yeah, is yeah, to, yeah. Well, mindfulness is just about, um, our, our brain has a negativity bias. Okay. So what that means is that we automatically, naturally focus on the bad stuff. Mm. Now that's an evolutionary thing because right. our ancestors needed to do that. We needed to look out for the predators of and the stuff that was, was going to harm us. Um, and so it's still there with us because um, our brains are still fundamentally very primitive at, yeah. the, at the base. And so our negativity bias means that we focus on the negative stuff. Mm-hmm. So you might have a great day and then towards the end of the day, you pick up an email that makes you feel bad or you have a conversation with someone that makes you feel bad. Um, or you, you know, you've had a great day and you've been into lots of coffee shops and places and you've had lots of great customer service and then you get one bad customer <laughs> service. That's the thing you remember. Yeah, yeah. So th- this negativity bias means that we miss out on really noticing and really embracing and enjoying the good stuff. Yeah. There is amazing stuff that goes on every, day. every second of every day, but we kind of gloss over that and we focus on the negative. Definitely. So mindfulness can help us to really focus on what's the good stuff that's happening to me today even when overall my day is not as going as the way that I'd like it to, maybe mm. somebody smiled at me, okay. you know, when, when they gave me the, the my coffee when I went into Starbucks or whatever. Or, you know, maybe I, you know, I'm just thinking my, my brother often sends me pictures of my nieces and that just brightens my day. It doesn't matter what kind of day I'm having. I just go, oh, I just focus on this. How do I feel looking at this? Yeah. Definitely. So, yeah, I think mindfulness helps, helps us to have choice. Because if we don't stop and become consciously aware of what we're doing and what we're experiencing. Life happens without us having any control over it. So mindfulness helps us to have more control, helps us to have more choice. Mm. And choice is great. I, I know that was one of your other questions as mm. well, Kesha, around like what maybe people resist when it comes mm. to mindfulness or yeah. why they struggle to get into it. So yeah. I, I was just know. thinking of that. So, you know, that we've talked about so many of the great benefits yeah. of practicing. And I mm. think that's the key word, right? Is yeah. You have to practice it because... Yeah you from an evolutionary point of view you have a bias towards negativity so you're going to seek to keep confirming and adding to that like you said um it's like this big sticking ball of stuff that you just keep collecting and adding to right um and mindfulness helps you to just unpick it or Mm -hmm. even just notice it you know um why do you think people struggle uh Mm -hmm. i don't want to use the word fail Mm -hmm. but you talked about i think approaching it from the wrong lens as well at the beginning of the show that uh, we've got a lot of mindless people uh, and, and actually we, we're born mindful. I love that analogy, mm. but you learn to become mindless. So it's mm. just about remembering how to be mindful. So it's already there. It's yeah. innate to you. It's such an empowering belief. Mm. Um, but why why do people struggle and why do they resist it when mm-hmm. 
I'm sure we could speak for a good... For, you've done a master's degree yeah. in this topic. Yeah, yeah. So one of the... And interestingly, one of the, the main things that, that gets in the way, and it was the subject of my master's dissertation, was about time. Like, who, who has lots of spare time on their hands? Not many people. Time is one of the things that, that is very precious. We feel we don't have enough of it. And we've got so many other things to do that we, we perhaps see sitting doing nothing as a waste of time. But actually, I would argue, and a lot of research backs up the argument that doing nothing is exactly what we need to do sometimes. So, but I think time is the issue. Um, you know, it's the same reason why people struggle to get into going to the gym and doing exercise because it takes time. And there's always other things we could be doing. So I think that's the first thing. But I, I really believe that, that it doesn't have to take a lot of time. And I think to start off with, if time is something that is a barrier to people, things like the, the stuff that's in my ebook, the, the little things you can do, the sort of micro mindfulness that you can drop into your day or the, the you know, mindful minutes or pauses that you, you can have, I think that's a great way to take that barrier away. You know, so when you're sitting drinking, you know, okay, so I've got some water here. I could quite easily just drink that and not even be aware of it. So if I'm going to drink the water, I know it's good for me and I know I need it. So why don't I just really, for the few seconds it takes to drink that water, just really focus on drinking the water? How does it feel when the, the, the water touches my lips? How does it feel to swallow the water? That takes seconds, mm. that should be mindful. So, mm. uh, so I think time can be a barrier. I think the preconceptions about what mindfulness is and what mindfulness practice is can put people off. Certainly put me off at the start meditation I was like what's that all about <laughs> like A sitting cross legged is uncomfortable you know B that's a bit hippie-ish isn't it <laughs> and you know nothing wrong with you know people who who, who love that sort of stuff but it, it just wasn't for me and it certainly was it put me off at first what I have learned is that you don't have to sit cross legged we've just proved that you can sit on a chair um, but in fact you can you can do mindfulness when you're running when you're walking yeah. you know a lot of people do yoga and stuff like that that's mindfulness mm. so so you so the pre preconceptions about sitting and practicing mindfulness I think are not necessarily true um, so there's different ways you can practice mindfulness um, and it can be totally I mean I, I've worked with business leaders in corporate organisations, I won't name names, but big corporate organisations that if you go into the city, you'll see their names on the sides of the, the buildings. Um, and they'll sit and do mindfulness. So it, and maybe they're hippies, maybe they're not. They don't look like it, you know? So, you know, there are people in suits doing mindfulness. So I think there's a lot of preconceptions about what mindfulness is and who practices it. And, and actually everyone, everyone can, can do it. Um, so and everyone does people, do it, I suppose. Yeah. In some yeah. level, it's just your level of awareness and raising that, you know, all the time so that you're yeah. just more aware of, how does it feel for, for my foot to sit here on this table or, yeah. you know, things like that. And I, I love that uh, thing that you talked. It made me think like seeing mindfulness as just restricted to one practice and that practice being the image of a monk or some hippie mm -hmm. dude or yeah. woman just sitting in a cross-legged position. Mm. You're restricting that. It's like seeing football as just doing kick-ups. Yes. But it's all these different skills that come yeah, into it. And yeah. one of the things that I got... So the reason we met was because, you know, uh, you trained me uh, for a day <laughs> in mindfulness coaching. And the thing that blew my mind that I came away with from that was for ages, my habit has always been meditate because uh, that's how I came into this mm. discipline or this practice. And you just said two words, informal and formal. And that immediately just made me realize, just always be meditating. Yeah. Like, you know, you've got the ABC of always be closing. Now yeah, it became yeah. like, always be meditating. I yeah. just changed it to ABM, like yeah, drop the yeah, C9 yeah. at the yeah. end. Because you can always be practicing that. Mm. And it could just be the way I pick this up. Mm -hmm. And that's my mindful minute. Yeah. And just yeah. finding as many of those as I can Definitely. throughout the day. I mean, that's the thing. When I'm running my eight-week um, classes, what I'm doing is I'm, I'm teaching people how to meditate and some of the practices that we do, which is great. But we also talk about, right, what's the stuff you do every day anyway? You brush your teeth every day, probably twice a day, if not more. Yeah. So why don't you just use that as your mindfulness practice for that day? So just really focus. And a way to really consciously focus on brushing your teeth is use the opposite hand to the one you normally use. Yeah. 
Mm. Yeah. So I use my right. See, if you try and do it with the left, you have to really think about it. Mm. So, so it could be something like that. It could be your your um, you know, your your daily commute if you walk to the tube or the bus or you cycle or whatever it is. Just use those minutes where you're you're doing it anyway. Mm. You know, or putting the kettle on. So most of us will put the kettle on and we'll find something else to do. We'll pick up our phone and start doing. So just use the few seconds it takes for the kettle to boil. Um, you know, or if you've got a fancy coffee machine for it to percolate, whatever, just use that time to just notice. And I think that's the thing. So what what is it? What do I do in that time? Well, just notice your feet on the ground or your bum on the seat, whatever it happens to be. Just notice how your body feels. Focus on your breathing. So just allow your breath. To, to move just as we did in that practice um, and then what you do is you start to notice thoughts um, but you know when the thoughts come just go okay for these few seconds I'm just doing this I'm just doing whatever is the one thing that I'm doing so the formal practice is really important you know it's like if you want to if you're going to run the London Marathon you're going to have to train for it yeah, you're yeah. going to have to put in some hours mm. so if you want to become more mindful and mindful and for it to be more part of your life then doing the sitting practices is, is good and important but if that feels like too much um then try the informal stuff mm. and if you're doing the formal stuff the informal stuff it just mm. like is a, has a cumulative effect do you think that um what do you think the link is between silence and mindfulness because one of the things that i've i i do is uh i just spend a day in silence i don't mm. speak so i'm just cutting out one um distraction mm -hmm. and, I, and it forces me to even just check uh you know because i'm at home with my family and they might say something and i i really want to go oh don't do that or mm -hmm. you should do this and i just noticed i was about to say that mm -hmm. and just coming back and just going back into observer mode but mm -hmm. i'm just wondering what do you th think the connection is between silence and mm -hmm. Mindfulness, because again, lots of practices advocate that as well. Mm -hmm. Let me ask you a question. So when you're in that day of silence, mm. what difference do you notice it makes to you? I, I notice that it's what you said about focus. Mm -hmm. I'm not focusing on trying to change what I see in front of me. Okay. I'm just focused on, I'm an observer. Yeah. I'm noticing. Or as, as you would say, Keshav Bat, the character, mm. is noticing how she cooks the food yeah. and is chopping those onions. Yeah. And it encourages me to become more aware of the river of thoughts. Yeah. So, oh yeah. Okay, cool. Mm. Oh, I'm resisting that thought. That's interesting. Yeah. Mm. And I, and I, and I then start to picture, well, what if I just welcome those thoughts for tea, mm -hmm. you know? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, and, and then I just welcome those emotions. Cause again, it's something that we, we overlook is we all know that we're emotional beings trying to make logical choices mm -hmm. in a very noisy world. But we lace that with a kind of intellectual character yeah. or way of speaking so that it seems that we're not that way. But yeah. we really are. Yeah, yeah. exactly. We really are. Yeah. And, and when you can just learn to notice that, you start to see the difference between emotion and feeling. Yes. Mm. Yeah. Because yeah. one is the natural instinct gut reaction that you get yeah. and you react. And the other is a response like, okay, this is my yeah. emotion. So here's why I want to behave yeah. or I so want that, the character. So that, a key thing there is, is the space that you create mm. between something happening and then what you do. So for a lot of us, there's not much space. Something happens and we react. But what we can do by pausing, by allowing silence, is we open up that space and we then respond. And usually that response is a better balance between the logic and the emotion. Yeah. So I think silence is, is absolutely wonderful. Um, you know, I go on quite a lot of long retreats and we can spend like more than a day in silence. And it, it's amazing being around other people mm. and not speaking. And at first it feels really odd, but then what I notice is that I get more mental space. So the chatter, the constant chatter that we have in our heads quietens down. Because when we're with other people, and even if we're not with other people, um, our mind is constantly active and we're constantly looking at what I'm processing and thinking. And especially if we are with other people, there's a sort of social um, need to to interact. And so I look at you and I go, what, what am I going to say to you? And then you say something and I think, what am I going to say back? And when we allow silence, there's none of that needs to happen. So silence really um, is a mindfulness practice as well, as well, because as you said, you notice what happens to your mind when you allow silence. But it creates space. Mm. It creates space. And for people who are creative or people who would like to be creative, 
creating that mental space is a fantastic um, mm. benefit, mm. you know, to, to allowing that science. And to kind of follow on from that, just, mm. I, I guess we could even say, we're, good, we're actually going to go into social reform fair of the week and thanks for kind of second, but actually what what are some harmful things that or, or things that you think people just need to be weary of? Yeah. Because uh, with any buzzword or, f- you know, thing, yeah. uh, there's always marketers or people, totally. you know, who are trying to yeah. take advantage of that. Yeah. Um, not all marketers are bad. We've got a, a great <laughs> one sitting on the couch. No offense to anyone out there. But yeah, what are some of the yeah. things? Yeah, so I think the first for? thing is that mindfulness is not a panacea. It is not a cure-all. It's not something that solves problems. Mm. So, and particularly if people have mental or physical challenges um going on mindfulness can help but it's not the it, it's it's not the thing that's going to is going to solve the problem so i think that's the first thing is to not go into it thinking this thing's going to and i think there's a, there are some people out there that i think give the impression that mindfulness is a panacea and i absolutely right. don't so i think that's the first thing um i think the other thing is to definitely start this in a way that works for you. So using an app or you know, using the little clip that we did there or doing some reading or whatever it is. But I think get get with other people, find other people who are practicing mindfulness. Mm. And ideally um, find somebody who is who's qualified in mindfulness to help you with your mindfulness journey. You know, I went through a whole um, teacher training pathway to become a qualified mindfulness teacher. And there's a register of UK registered mindfulness teachers. Um, so I think I think start to do the practice, but be aware that, you know, it's like anything, when we start to look at something through new eyes, we see it differently and we might start to see things that we didn't see before. They were always there, but we didn't see them before. We might not always like them. So we might notice thoughts that keep coming up that we don't like. We might notice feelings that we don't particularly feel comfortable with. We might start thinking about ourselves in a way that, and it was a bit challenging. Like, oh, I thought I knew myself and now, oh my goodness, I'm noticing this other stuff. So to deal with all of that on our own can be quite challenging. Um, so it's like anything, I think. Um, talk to people. There's lots of people practicing mindfulness. So share with friends or, you know, online communities as well. Um, but if it's something you feel you can really sense a benefit in, then then actually do an, an actual course, do an eight-week course. Part of my research that I did for the second year of my master's was looking at what what ways of learning about mindfulness really work because there's a lot of online stuff there's a lot of self-directed stuff but at the end of the day having a community you know it, when we learn with other people that's when we learn best I, I believe um, and I think when we're starting to kind of just look at our experience with a wee bit more depth then I think it's good to be around people who can support us so notice when it's starting to feel a bit edgy, a, but like, okay, stuff's coming up that I'm not really comfortable mm. with. Or I'm trying this and it just doesn't seem to be working for me. What's yeah. going on? Talk to people. Talk to people Definitely. who are experienced. And on that note, I've actually got a question for you because uh, you talked about community and, mm. and then you've got something like uh, the Leadership Academy. You know, mm. what what do you think the link is there and how, how has mm. that helped with yeah. that sense of community from what you've seen. Yeah, I think, you know, and I can speak on my own behalf as well as other people within the Leadership Academy, but I think, you know, you spoke about the fact that some people either resist or find that they struggle to engage with what mindfulness is and it might be the perspective that's put on it. But also, you know, it's different for a lot of people because, you know, a high percentage of the population are not necessarily engaging in this and sometimes people feel it's like, Am I going to be classed as hippie or tree yeah. hugger or whatever? Yeah. You, you know, that, that kind of vibe. But with the Leadership Academy, what we try to do is celebrate these things. Yeah. So, you know, we will celebrate someone who's set themselves a 90 day challenge of I'm going to engage in mindfulness practices and or meditation every single day. Because you're being celebrated for that, you don't turn around and go, well, actually, this is beneficial for me. But not only that, another thing that we always try to do is get people to reflect. So I know mindfulness is about being present. Mm-hmm. But then what we get them to do after is say, well, Let's reflect on how you were able to function and operate as a result of you engaging in a mindfulness practice, which, you know, for me, myself, that's what I, I was, I've done. So being around other people in the leadership academy, being around other people within the community that we've built, what I realized was when I first started saying I was going to, you know, start meditating, I said to myself, I'll do it three days a week. But then I realized on the four days when I wasn't, but by, through my reflection, I realized on the four days I wasn't. 
I didn't feel I had the same level of clarity, awareness and focus. Mm -hmm. So I said, this has to be a daily practice now. But that only came through me being mindful and then being reflective about my mindfulness practice, which is again, me being mindful in some ways. Um, So I think what happens is mindfulness almost creates this snowball effect in Mm -hmm. some ways where because you've engaged in a particular practice, you then become more mindful of, oh, well, actually, I wasn't able to be as productive today Mm -hmm. or focus or have the clarity that I had. And so then what I then get is on a Sunday, I'd go and see everybody else in the leadership academy who's sharing their their levels of productivity this week and the habits they engaged in and looking at all of the great successes they had. And I'm sharing, they're going, I've got successes, but then actually I could have done even more had I, for example, been more consistent with this. And so then it allows us to tweak and change the way in which we function and operate so mm-hmm. i hope that answers mm-hmm. yeah yeah so what he's referencing there is we actually on a sunday have a thing where let's all share what we call a rear view reflection mm-hmm. which is a cool name we came up with where we just talk about like what came up this week what mm-hmm. fear did we notice what we're we grateful for to kind of round it off and mm-hmm. then start the new week with you know what am i focusing on this week and mm-hmm. what's what's the on the agenda um and one of the things we actually do is thanks for the cut yeah mm-hmm. of course as with every episode we do thanks for the cut mm-hmm. so who wants to do thanks for the cut because we've all got a thanks for the cut to share do you want to do you I, know? i'll save mine for the next one I'll... so yeah we'll start with you I don't know, shall I don't we oh. yeah i'll do a thanks for the cut so um i mean i had two but if you're going to save yours for the next episode then actually no, i'll just do one of mine i'll just do one of mine um so one of my cuts actually came this week on monday when we were at handsworth grammar school so we were delivering a day of workshops as part of an enrichment day so we had all of their year 10s doing a carousel around three of our particular workshops which specifically focus on young people developing personal development and you know, character education as well as them understanding the world around them so they can be better engaged with life beyond the classroom and which then allows them to excel their performance within the classroom so the attends we were looking at like mental health and understanding you know what is mental health and how might people what kind of issues do people suffer with and how can you go about being more aware of those mm-hmm. or more mindful of it and then go about hopefully being able to deal with some of those issues mm-hmm. that arise and understanding that in relation to emotional well-being Another session was based on um, financial education. So young people becoming more financially literate and understanding the world of money. So then that way they can start to get a grasp of that from as young as 14, 15. And then the other one with the year 10 was on like gender stereotypes and masculinity, which is what I was running. So getting young men to understand, you know, how sometimes they engage in misogynistic um, activities or views or perspectives and how to actually go about challenging those. Mm. But then with the year 13, it was a bit different. We focused more on like, you know, actually there was one session that was specifically focused on handling stress mm. and using certain breathing techniques to deal with stress, okay. but also being aware of how to ideally um, prevent stress coming in the first place, but then also giving them the, the, the measures to cure as well. And then that one was more on sort of like um, what they're going to do after leaving year 13 and going to maybe the university environment. So ensuring that they understand the roles, responsibilities and relationships that they may develop there. But I was running that year 10 session on gender stereotypes and masculinity. And I just love it because you've got 50, 14 to 15 year old boys who, you know, they're gonna be a bit childish at times, but that's okay. I let them know this is your space to share your honest views. Don't share views that you think we want to hear. Mm -hmm. I want you to be real about this. Um, but because of that, I get really engrossed in the sessions. I get really engrossed in like, you know, okay, so you said that the ideal woman is this, but why, you know, and I want to challenge that and all that. So I spend quite long on our first activity, which is something called a word race. So we've got an hour and 15 minutes of the session and I'll be real. From, like, from the time I do the introduction to the end of that word race, it's supposed to be about half an hour. I'm taking 50 minutes on just that, do you know what I mean? And, you know, my colleague Shirin, who essentially line manages all of us for the day, she's the one that coordinates the day. She came up to me after the, after my second session. I was like, listen, I do not want to see you spend that long on that in the next session. And she's like, you've got one more session left. And you, you per- and she said, you miss out one particular activity. I said, yeah, because I don't think that that activity is required because they're already bringing those same views and um, perspectives are coming out in the word race. And plus, you know, logistically, the room is... And she's like, no do it in the third session and it was like thanks for the cut because what it made me realize was you might think that they're not that you're they're getting the value from having done this activity but how do you know there's not one or two other young people in the class Mm -hmm. who if you did do that activity might get more out of the session Mm -hmm. not only that it's that thing of like you might have this level of experience but there is a reason why 
Shirin or the rest of the team have designed the session in this yeah. way. It's yeah. purposely designed to build in a certain way. Mm -hmm. And so the cut was, Lewis, you need to realize that actually honoring your craft is not just about knowing when to be able to change things. It's also about knowing when to stay mm -hmm. consistent. Yeah. And that's honoring your craft. And so for me, that was the thanks for the cut. Because then it's funny when we were on the train back later that day, I was talking about, oh, you know, because one of our other colleagues is Shani was a teacher and we was having a conversation. I was saying, oh, I wonder what, um, I wonder if I could be a good teacher, that kind of thing. Shani was like, yeah, I think you'd be great. Shirin was like, I think you would too, but no, mm -hmm. no one would ever get through the curriculum. It'd take too long. And I was like, thanks for the cut. Do you know what I mean? So yeah, that was my thanks for the cut yeah. this week. So thank you very much, Shirin, for just <laughs> increasing my level of awareness about certain things. Yeah, so yeah, 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 definitely. Do you have a cut as well, Susan? Yeah, I do. And I was thinking about it and it, it was probably not quite so recent. It was maybe three or four weeks ago. Um, and I was on, on a call to someone, they did somebody I haven't done work with before, but somebody who I know through someone, that's quite often how my work comes, kind yeah. of word of mouth. And this person was, was saying, look, I'd really like to be involved in this piece of work. And on the face of it, it seemed like a really good opportunity, but there was just, there was, it was almost like there was a little, little, um, you know, person sitting on my shoulder going, no, don't do it. Don't yeah. do it. But there was another part of me going, but why not? It, yeah. You know, and, and like logically it makes sense. It does all these things. It'd be a really good thing to do. You know? But there's a, a big part of me going, no, it's not right. It's not right. But I didn't listen to that part of me. Okay. So I didn't listen to my what my gut was telling me, my intuition. And I was like, yeah, cool. Yeah, I'll, I'll get involved. Well, it then transpired that this piece of work was going to just have be massive. It was going to be so much stuff that needed to be done. And I just, at that point, I was just finishing writing my, literally finishing writing my dissertation. And I was like, oh, I should so have listened to my gut instinct. And so I spent an afternoon sitting there going, oh, what do I do? What do I do? Because I'm, I'm a very loyal person oh, okay. and I follow up on my commitments. If I commit to doing something, I'll, I'll do it. I find it really hard to go back on it. And so I had this real battle going on about, should I just do it because I've said I'm going to do it? But there's this, this part of me that was saying, no, it's not going to end well for you and you'll not do your best work because you're going to be distracted. And and so I had to make a really difficult phone call. Mm. But the, the cut for me was that the phone call wasn't actually as difficult as I thought it would be. In my head, I'd made it up into yeah. this thing. This person was going to be so disappointed in me. I was never going to get any work from them again. My reputation would be affected. Uh, I had the phone call and, and the guy said, do you know what? I kind of sensed that you were saying yes, but you really meant no. Mm. So I'm really glad you've told me at this point. Yeah. So the cut for me was listen to your gut. Yeah. You yeah. know, really listen to it. And before you jump into saying yes to something, just step back and go, okay, what was this? What's this voice trying to tell me? Yeah. And also, you know, the way we think things are going to go in our mind is often not as bad as it oh, actually goes. Oh, definitely. Go. I've so. had that many a time where I've, you know, for example, I've agreed to something then realised I can not yeah. keep this commitment and I tell myself, no, yeah. but I can't let them down and yeah. then you have a the conversation they're like, okay, no worries. Yeah, yeah. And you're like, oh, okay, yeah. fair enough. Do you know <laughs> exactly. what I mean? Like, yeah. it's, it's yeah. so true. It's so mm -hmm. true. Yeah. Cool. Social reform fade of the week. We must introduce the social reform fade of the week. Should I do mine? Yeah. Oh, you okay. have to. All right, cool. So, there's all of this talk in the media right now and a lot of lights being shone on the Harvey Weinstein situation, right? You know, with these allegations of him sexually assaulting women throughout his career. And rightly so, you know, if, if this is true, and you know, I think there's, there's some, um, apparently some footage and some interviews where he's admitted to that. At the end of the day, we must not stand for it. And it's absolutely bang out of order, 100%. However, the president of the United States has pretty much done some things that are identical to Harvey Weinstein from the viewpoint of sh openly sharing that he has sexually assaulted women. Openly sharing that this is something that he would probably do again. He's even referenced his own daughter as saying that if she was older, she'd probably be the standard of being my girlfriend. So why is it that we've got people who are willing to defend Mr. Trump? But they're then, on the other hand, so quick to attack Harvey Weinstein. What Harvey Weinstein done is wrong. We know that. Of course, it still needs to go through trials and all that kind of thing. But why are we not holding people to the same standard and holding people not to the same account? So for those people out there who are in some ways trying to justify what Mr. Trump has done, but then are quick to attack Harvey Weinstein, you are the social reform fail of this week. Society not attacking Mr. Trump in the same way. We are the social reform fed of this week. What I do love, though, is the fact that in the States, there are a lot of people attacking him right now. Like I saw the thing with um, 
you know, in the, in the NBA, when the Golden State Warriors won the championship last year. And as, as a result of that, you're always invited to the White House. And Stephen Curry said, I will not be going to the White House. Absolutely not interested. And then Mr. Trump tweets, oh, that should be a, um, an honor for you to come to the White House. You're not invited. And everyone was like, he didn't want to come anyway. So there's no point trying to retract an invitation. He never wanted to come in the first place. So then people were like, you're a bum to, to Mr. Trump. Do you know what I mean? Just getting onto him. So I love the fact that people are doing that. But I think we shouldn't just be doing it over social media. We shouldn't just be doing it for certain reasons. That is exactly the same thing. And he must be attacked in the same way. So that is my social form mm. fail of the week, in my opinion. Mm. I think to add to that, the, the, the problem is that there's a, there's a couple of things like one is um, it's very peculiar, shall we say, who we choose to go after mm. or who we're told to, cho- to chosen to go after. Um, ben Affleck, you know, there's things coming out about him now mm. um, where there's footage of um, women that he's sexually harassed on live TV and they've then had to lie about it or um, court cases that have been put forward that have been kind of quashed. Um, and I think it's obviously probably a very known thing um, within the industry and it's coming out now. You know, we had um, all of the child sexual harassment cases here in the UK as well. Mm-hmm. Um, the other thing that I, I, I look at and I'm by no means defending him is I, th- I think we also have a culture of uh, shame porn. But we love to shame the perpetrator, but also not to ask the question, well, what creates that? You know, mm-hmm. Harvey Weinstein is you know his behavior is horrible as a human being he's a human being and i think there's a separation that we always yeah, got to have yeah to, of condemning the behavior very very strongly it's not okay and there are consequences that should follow and mm. hopefully will mm. um but i think it's that question of well what creates that kind of toxic masculinity mm. that gives men the entitlement to feel mm. they can take control of a woman's body in that way mm. um I was talking to a good friend of mine. If we go just to a more local level, um, she went out clubbing and um, she was saying, you know, I've, I'd forgotten this. I was surprised that I'd forgotten how entitled men in clubs feel yeah. to just come and touch you. Mm. And she was standing in uh, the queue to get her stuff from the cloakroom. And a man just came up and just grabbed her, her breasts and just put his hand straight across in full view of everyone. Unacceptable. And then when they said, when they obviously got angry about that and, you know, said, what the F are you doing? Mm. Um, the response was like, oh, don't, don't be uh, a stush or don't be, you know, kind of, um, I don't know what the word is I'm looking for, but you know what I'm, I'm talking about. Mm. And I, I think that's just interesting and yeah. something that also is important to kind of look at. Um, with, with things like this, I, you know, what role do you think mindfulness can have, if any? Yeah, well, what I was thinking when, when, when you were both talking there was, um, I guess, just taking that step back and just looking at, we can so easily get caught up in what other people are thinking. And, and I think media and social media, you know, is great, but also, oh my goodness, causes so many problems mm. because we can we can get so caught up in other people's points of view and other people's ways of thinking that we before we know it, we're buying into a view that may actually not really fit with our own values, but it's just kind of what everyone else is saying. And we become very judgmental. And, you know, and you talked about um, Harvey Weinstein and and he will go through the process and he will be, he will be, um, he'll be judged in the right way and, 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 you know, in in the right uh, environment. But I think we can be very judgmental and we can often, um, yeah, we can also often kind of sit in a place and look at other people and go, well, what they're doing is wrong, but hey, I'm, you know, and actually we're all human beings. And I think that's the crucial thing is to remember behind whatever we see from people, there's a human being there and they, just like us, um, fundamentally, we all want the same thing. You know, we all want to be happy. Mm. We all want to, you know, live life and enjoy it. We all want to experience some level of success. Um, some people just have a funny way of going about it, but who are we to see who's right and who's wrong? As in us sitting here on the couch as mm. opposed to, you know, people in a courtroom or whatever. So yeah, I think it's, it's complicated and it's complex, but I think mindfulness helps us to just notice where our judgments are coming from, mm. you know, and go, okay, so do I have a right to judge in that way? And actually, what if I see beyond mm. the surface 
mm. and and compassion compassion and kindness are really important parts of mindfulness practice as well and so we do start to to recognize that you know yeah the, the bigger picture i think mm. i think you know what you said there around do we have a right to judge i think that's big that's something i've learned a lot is that like sometimes people try to start conversations with me about like oh yeah can you believe this is happening and often I, I don't really have an answer because mm. I don't feel I'm in a position where I deserve to be able to put forward a strong point of view I'm not informed enough mm. I haven't had a similar experience so often I just listen mm. and then I just mm. nod and that's it but also I think to, to contribute to what you said Susan and answer your question Kesh I think it's how mindfulness plays a part is us actually thinking about how are we contributing to this yeah. So, you know, I know me and you have spoken a lot in the last year, Kesha, about, you know, we would never disrespect a woman and we try our best to stay far from misogyny. But even down to the little things of like, do we, for example, add to that feeling of that sense of masculinity without even realising that we're doing it? So you spoke yeah. about sometimes we'll get on a train and sometimes just like, I'll put just my bag on this that. seat yeah. and yeah. I'll put my... Then it's like, well, hold on. Who do you think you are? Do you mm-hmm. know what I mean? Like, so it's, it's that. And also it's like, I, I know that I, for example, grew up around people who didn't show women the utmost respect and it didn't sit well with me but I would always just ensure I didn't do something and then actually as I got older I said no you need to start challenging that as well yeah. because you can say that by you not engaging with it that's okay but it's just as bad to see and not say yeah. as it is to just not engage in the activities yeah. you know what I mean so I had to start challenging friends of mine and say like why is that okay yeah. like hold on like you said you want to have you know a wife and a healthy family or whatever it is in the future but if that's the way you're treating women now, like, why is that okay with you? Mm. Do you know what I mean? I'm not saying I think I'm a saint, but at the end of the day, that's not good enough, bro. Mm. And I'm going to tell you that. And you can decide whether to take this in or not, mm. but you need to honestly have a, have a conversation with yourself about whether that's okay. So I think yeah. in terms of mindfulness, it was about me being aware of the fact that just because, Lewis, you're not doing it, doesn't mean you don't have moral responsibility. So mm. that was my process mm. of mindfulness. I had to go through saying, take on board the responsibility yeah. that you rightfully have to take you know so yeah it reminds me of um we did a spoken word cipher last year and and one of the lines someone said was uh every saint has a past and every sinner has a future Mm. uh and 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 do you want to wrap up because i know it's your do i want to wrap up (laughs) you've got the power today well that's it so guys this has been another amazing episode you know and hopefully you guys have got just as much from it please remember to leave your comments below hit like and most importantly as well share this you know literally take the link put it into the facebook groups you're in the whatsapp groups you're in you know like if you're in an, another country where you guys use a different social media platform that we don't use like wechat or something like that share it with people truly put it out there and let's start some conversations about what you guys think about these episodes but specifically for this one you know what did you learn about mindfulness today what are the things that you plan to be able to now apply to your life when it comes to mindfulness because that is exactly what it's about and susan actually spoke about the fact that in her dissertation she focused on time And so I'm going to take a small little part of my spoken word piece on time. And it was this. And I I set this bar up by saying that I'm about to make a comparison that might make me sound greedy and hollow. But in no way do I plan to fill anyone with sorrow. And some of you might even think I'm joking, like live at the Apollo. But I think it's only fair to strive for if it's true when we say YOLO. So this is it. You wake work eight hours to cover a bill. But I want to work eight hours and make a meal. And at no point should I have to lie, cheat, steal or kill. Simply just manage my time and my resources and watch my empire build. So you can do the same, guys. Thank you for watching another episode of Leadership Lessons. Kesh, always a pleasure, my friend. Thank you so much for being here. Susan, honestly, thank you so much for joining us. Guys, remember, leave your comments below and we'll see you again next time. Peace. That was so yeah, cool. Yeah, that was cool, it? It's still that was my cool, it? That was my cool, it? Yes, that was nice. And you won that, that what the, the So we always try to do the little something, yeah, do you know what I mean? So, because obviously, we both got like small spoken word pieces yeah. and we can 